Okay, hi. Uh, welcome to our fifth Network Power Hour. I'm Brian Kalachi, a postdoctoral scholar uh, with the Labor of Futures team here at Data and Society. I'll be your host for tonight alongside my team behind the curtain, CJ, Audrey, Rigo, Eli, and Rona. So I'm just going to get right to it and, and turn it over to our guest speakers, Meredith Whitaker and Wendy Liu, uh, for today's talk. I'm personally very excited to have both of them here. Uh, Wendy has just written an amazing book, uh, which is sort of like part memoir, part political economy of the tech industry called Abolish Silicon Valley. Uh, and Meredith is a leader in, among many other things, uh, tech worker organizing, having helped organize the Google Walkouts, and the co-founder of AI, uh, the AI, AI Now Institute at New York University. So without further ado, uh, take it away, Meredith. Thank you, Brian. And thank you so much to the Data and Society crew for hosting this space. I saw how much work went into it. Um, and I know I'm among many who are really grateful to be able to go somewhere with these conversations right now um, in this quarantine life we're living. Um, so I'm, I'm also just delighted to be here with Wendy, um, you know, to get a chance to discuss your book, Wendy. And I'm going to give a, a couple of framing comments. Um, you know, I don't think it's up for debate, especially among this crowd, that you know, tech is a force that's helping centralize power across a number of domains. Um, and I think one of the things that Wendy kind of puts her finger on in this book is, you know, the political economy underlying tech, that these, these technologies are created by private firms. They're driven by kind of predictable pursuits of revenue, growth, profit, and power. And that over the past decade, tech companies have worked to integrate these, you know, technologies that are driven based on those incentives, that are created based on those incentives, um, you know, through kind of the nervous system of our social infrastructures. So I know that, you know, to varying degrees, we're kind of waking up or, or we've already known, but to, to a world in which we've turned over power to make significant social decisions, determining who's worthy of resources, who gets a job, who gets opportunity, um, essentially the companies who have convinced us that human progress is synonymous with their growth and their profits. And I think this is something that, again, Wendy kind of, you know, really, really um, explores deeply in her book. Thank you, Meredith, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to the Data and Society team for organizing this. I'm really honored to be here. And, and so, you know, if I come out here with a title like Abolish Silicon Valley, it's going to rub some people the wrong way. And I think, you know, that's, that's fair enough. Um, but I do want to get the point across that there are some great things about the industry as it currently stands, um, but there are also some really horrible flaws. Um, and you can say that they're structural flaws. They were built into the way the system is designed. And, and that's a really difficult kind of uh, gap to cross over. And it's hard to reconcile those perspectives, but it does kind of make sense if you see the bubble as um, something that's structural. So it's, it's not the fault of the people in the industry if they're unable to see its flaws. It doesn't mean they are, you know, bad people and it, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with them. It just means that structurally they're situated in a position which means that they only ever get to see the good things and they're unable to see the bad. And of course, that doesn't mean that the bad doesn't exist. It just means that certain people are shielded from it. And so we get to a point where you can have venture capitalists uh, talk about how inequality is good and companies like Uber and Lyft only ever create opportunity. And, you know, on the one hand, sure, what they're saying could be self-serving. It could just be they, they want to justify their own place. But I also think they probably do believe it to some degree. And, you know, it's not surprising that they believe it because of the position they occupy within the system. Um, and if we, you know, if we take a step back and talk about capitalism and how capitalism appears to people, capitalism always has two sides, right? There's the, there's, there's the really nice side. There's the side of um, rewards and innovation and uh, achievements and productivity and, you know, the ability to make a lot of money and to do whatever you want. The side of freedom, that is the side that the beneficiaries of the industry have access to. They do not see the other side. They do not have to um, experience the downsides of capitalism in the same way that most people do. They never see the disciplinary side. They are not the ones who are woken up by, you know, a notification on their phone that tells them that they need to do, do this like gig 
gig job just to be able to pay their rent. They do not experience capitalism the same way that other people do. And I think that kind of gets to the heart of what I'm trying to do with the book, which is to, uh, to break this idea of a universal we. Because this is something that venture capitalists and tech thought leaders and you know, people who extol the virtues of the industry, they, they love the idea of just saying, we need to do something, right? Like, there's no left or right. We, ju we just need to go forward. We need to build. As if there is this monolithic we. Um, and of course, what they're doing is they're alighting the possibility that there are dif different interests at play, that there are people who want different things. And those interests can be diametrically opposed. You can have some people for whom um, they want nothing in the world other than to have other people work for them, right? They, they want control over other people. And then there are people who just want to be able to survive and not be under others' control. Those, those cannot be reconciled except through politics. Uh, I think it's a huge conceit in the tech industry that what they're doing is not necessarily political. It's just about progress. It's about innovation. It's about some kind of neutral idea of advancement. And of course, there's, there's nothing that's divorced from politics. Politics is all about how to reconcile, how to adjudicate different interests and different desires. And there is no way to step above that. Uh, I think that comes from this idea that the current system is apolitical. And you know, the status quo will always seem apolitical. And so anything that challenges that will seem political. But yeah, I think uh, in, in general, what I, what I would love to talk about in this conversation today is how, how Meredith, like how did you personally get to the point where you are now um, and what was the voice inside your head telling you like if did you have did you have this weird kind of um like I don't know what to call it just a because for me I think the, what I had was I I really believed in the tech industry to the extent where it was very very hard for me to accept the critiques of it and it took a really long time of like debating and trying to decide like what makes sense what doesn't make sense you know maybe the critics are just jealous um, right. I'm, I'm sure inequality is good. Uh, so yeah, I was just would love to hear from you. What was your experience like in, you know, accepting a more critical understanding of the industry? Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I have a weird winding path through the industry. So I um, went, I, I got out of college. I didn't have any money. I don't come from a place. I, I, my family doesn't have money. Um, and I needed a job. And back in the olden days, there was a website called Monster that was like LinkedIn. And Google found uh, my resume on Monster and hired me as a temp doing like um, technical documentation and essentially customer support. So that was my entree into tech. I have a, a humanities background. I didn't, I had no Sort of native interest in tech and back in 2006 when I started it was not the same thing it is today it was you know I, in in some ways the like hubris was worse because they had never been scorched before but in in many ways um it was a lot harder to find these critiques and while there was a small kind of cohort of scholars and advocates who were thinking very critically about this you know and there's a legacy of that thought it wasn't something that had come anywhere near to the sort of rarefied Mountain View campus you know, I, I was always interested in the sort of intersection of sort of the political and the social and technology, like where the, you know, where technology meets air. Um, and I worked on issues around privacy, which contained a lot of the same politics that the debates around sort of AI and, and social control now contain, but I think they've sort of moved on in that forum. And I worked around sort of issues of net neutrality. I ended up constructing, you know, being, being one of the co-founders of a sort of open source project that did internet performance measurement. And I'm not going to go into that, but it was, it was sort of an idea, you know, like how do we ensure that we, you know, that the net is neutral, right? Well, we collect data that sets a baseline whereby we can tell if performance is neutral or not, right? Of course, that implies that we're defining what neutrality is, that we have, you know, massive amounts of infrastructure. It implies that we're sort of instrumenting a Linux kernel to be able to like collect, like, specific TCP data, right? Like it goes all the way down the stack. It's incredibly not simple and it's deeply political. So I'm like working on this project, which is seemingly technical, kind of community driven infrastructure project. But behind the scenes, there are fierce battles around like what data is allowed to mean, around who gets to define the methodological specifications for data capture, around all of these things that when presented to the outside or sort of neutral technological 
artifacts that reflect simply the facts of the network, simply the facts of neutrality, right? Um, so that kind of primed me for like a deep suspicion when like machine learning and AI took over around like 2013, 2012, like 2013, 2014 was when it started sort of creeping into every kind of um, product area at Google and, and I was sort of being pitched things. Um, you know, I remember there was a team from an esteemed university that sort of pitched a machine learning model for genocide detection. And I was like, wait, what's going on? And, you know, my sort of distrust in data and my kind of like strange outsider status led me to be um, alarmed that this, you know, this extremely like fuzzy and fallible social data was being taken as a given. Um, and I think that was sort of the analytic lens, you know, combined with sort of a, a you know, acclimation and left politics for most of my life that like set me on the path to become more critical. Um, and I was really fortunate to sort of end up um, being exposed to and working with a number of scholars and researchers who were sort of thinking about that, who, um, who I was able to think with. But I, you know, that's, that's kind of my, ex you know, that, that is my experience. Um, through tech. Um, in, in listening to your conversation, um, I wanted to ask you both some questions uh, about the current moment that we're in. Um, so first off, um, you know, starting this week, uh, at least I think the latest number is 300 Amazon where, where, warehouse workers have pledged to stay home from work. Um, and at the same time, you know, in a sick outdoor strike. I um, mean, at the same time, two headquarters employees uh, named Emily Cunningham and Marin Costa were fired after trying to organize a virtual meeting between warehouse workers and white collar headquarters staff to talk about working conditions in the warehouses. And I'm wondering um, what, uh, what are some of the ways you see forward for this kind of a cross class solidarity within these companies or um, are between different companies within the tech industry? There is no where forward but this kind of cross class solidarity, right? If we're looking at the structures of these companies, there's, you know, we can think of the, you know, the metaphor of the tentacles, the metaphor of the nervous system, but, you know, they are everywhere and they are difficult to trace, right, from sort of education to med medicine to logistics to, you know, controlling the publishing industry to some extent, right? Um, so if we, you know, if we think of solidarity as something that has a number of wonderful benefits in terms of human relationships, but also builds power, you're going to need that power if you're going to contest these, you know, these corporate form formations that are now, you know, more powerful than most uh, nation states. So I think, you know, in terms of thinking about sort of who is a tech worker, about, you know, what is the goal of solidarity, we're looking at, you know, needing to form these links and needing to organize creatively together to think about, you know, what are the choke points and how do, you know, how do the people who are building the algorithm that determines the rate of work for warehouse workers in Amazon, you know, work with the you know, warehouse workers have the, you know, let the warehouse workers lead to begin to take that control. I completely agree. Uh, and I think on the, on the topic of solidarity, cross-class cross solidarity, um, it's, it is, it's actually quite funny in a sense that um, the tech industry is in the position it is because it's not, it's not natural, right? The fact that we have um, a small number of very well-paid white collar workers who have, at least some of them have quite a bit of marketplace bargaining power, while on the other hand, um, so many of the workers who actually do the essential work that keeps the industry running, they're paid so little money and some of them aren't even full-time employees. And yeah, I think it's important to remember how much this, of this is historically contingent and constructed and it's not always going to be like this, right? The fact that if you have a software engineering background and you went to a, a good school that you can get a good job at one of these tech companies and make a lot of money, it's, it hasn't always been like this and it won't always be like this. My allegiance to you know, my current position um, isn't, the, isn't the whole of my identity. Like I identify with other people. Like I, um, it's, it's a way of going beyond your individual circumstances and um, finding power in a collectivity that is composed of more than just, you know, other people who have similar job titles. And, and I think that's, this will be especially important during this time because um, a lot of people are losing their jobs and it's not limited to those who are low wage workers. We're even seeing white collar employees at tech companies lose their jobs or have their jobs under threat in some way. You know, I'm hearing about companies uh, like Airbnb and Yelp that are talking about layoffs and 
hiring freezes and, you know, rescinding summer internships. And it's, this is one of those things where it becomes very clear that the, uh, the structure, the structures that people have come to rely on and have come to think of as, you know, eternal and unchanging are actually quite contingent and they're shaped by other forces that are outside their control. And so, you know, if, you're a software engineer and you just expected your salary to go up and up and up forever. Well, I mean, that could be true, but it's also very possible that something else will change. Maybe the job market will just, you know, go under a downturn. I think people who've lived through the dot-com crash or, you know, the 2008, 2009 recession, for them, it's probably more clear, but I think there are people my generation and younger who've never actually had to live through those crises. Another, uh, this is a question well, for both of you, but it, it, it's uh, spurred by something uh, from, uh, from Wendy's book. Um, one, of the, one of the themes from your book that stood out for me, Wendy, uh, was sort of this idea of, um, or at least as I read it, sort of misdirection of entrepreneurial energy. Um, and what I mean by that is people um, entering the industry, uh, having innovative ideas, wanting to see them in the world, you know, wanting to help. Uh, but finding uh, their efforts uh, you know, funneled into uh, either uh, le socially less than beneficial directions or even socially destructive uh, de uh, directions by the economic imperatives of the industry or the profit needs of the firm that they work for. So your book's subtitle is How to Liberate Technology from Capitalism. Um, so what, are, uh, what, if any, are the ways you know, we can sort of rescue entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial uh, initiative and channel that innovation in, in more socially beneficial directions than what we're currently getting. So just to explain what I mean by the, you know, the misdirection of entrepreneurial energy, I think one of the really amazing things about startup culture is this idea that um, uh, people who have a lot of ambition and a lot of de determination can create something radically new and scale that up and produce a lot of change. And I think that's great. I think um, we should be giving more people the freedom to experiment and invent and build things. And it's, it's amazing. And I also think that the industry as it is now is not harnessing that talent to its full potential. And in some ways it's squandering it because it's not providing a suitable um, structure in which that energy can be, can be directed. And I think it's, it's a huge shame because we have, there are a lot of people who want to produce useful things but they're looking at the tech industry and, you know, the tech industry is the only place where there's enough money and they, they really want to be able to produce something within that structure, but it's just so difficult because um, if you look at just the financial incentives, the people who are making investment decisions, they can't actually afford to think about social good, right? Beyond, you know, as window dressing, as marketing. They have to think about making returns for their investors and how it, in the world that we exist in now, how are they going to get returns for their investors? For the most part, that's just by commodifying, you know, things that maybe should have been public services. And if you have the kind of venture capital perspective from, from which to see the world, then you look around and you're like, okay, how do we, how do we monetize that suffering a little bit? Oh, there are people who are not making enough wages to be able to afford to, you know, buy, f buy food or pay their rent. What if we gave them payday loans with an app? And I think that is kind of like the best you can hope for from, the Silicon Valley mindset. And that's not to say that the people who are making these decisions are bad people. I think it's just that they're hampered by a structure that prevents them from a way that is truly in the best interests of those they're supposed to be serving. The, the companies that do raise tons of money, I mean, they have really good PR teams. They're really good at saying that they're going to make the world a better place. But then if you look at what they actually do, their accountability is to shareholders. And the shareholders are wholly unrepresentative of, you know, the actual people they're supposed to be serving. So yeah, I think this misdirection of entrepreneurial energy is just one of the largest, um, I don't know, problems. It's just, it's just he's such a huge shame. Yeah, because I will co-sign that, um, yeah, this is not working. Uh, surprise ending. Um, I think, you know, I love that answer. And I, I guess I'll give like a slightly different spin on it to keep it lively and varied for our audience tonight. <laughs> um, um, I think, you know, I would sort of kind of follow the work of a number of science and technology studies scholars and like looking at tech as not sort of a 
it is not a neutral force that has been accidentally harnessed by capitalism, right? It's been co-constructed through these logics for years, right? And you can go back to the sort of history of the military, and then you can look at sort of, you know, the privatization of the web, and then, you know, the way it was made sort of safe for commerce, and, you know, the way that, you know, these sort of early winners of that kind of, you know, the, the, that web business model, the Facebooks and the Googles, then accrued the resources and the capital they needed to now sort of brand themselves and, and become these sort of leaders in AI and, you know, alongside the narrative that AI artificial intelligence is, is the new sort of driver of everything. So I think we look, need to look not only at sort of capitalism as a structure that prevents the sort of liberatory potential of these technologies, but actually like how were these technologies designed? How do they and for whom, right? And I think about specifically in the context of the sort of machine learning driven AI, which I spend a lot of my time with, and which is sort of, you know, kind of the, the I think the, the most prominent and dangerous narrative that is sort of furthering the infiltration of this technology everywhere. Um, and it requires these massive data sets, right? It requires this massive centralized computational power and the ability to sort of have access to continually collect these data. So a sort of market infrastructure that is widely distributed. And that sort of presupposes this sort of centralized power, right? That data is created not based on sort of a, a natural off-gassing of my, you know, my life as Meredith, but about what a corporation wants to know about me and thinks it can construct about me, right? And so I, you know, I kind of go back to maybe James Scott here, like there's sort of a, you know, whose gaze does this data represent? And is there a possibility of turning those types of technologies that presuppose a knower and billions of people who are known in that power asymmetry toward liberatory ends? And I, you know, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not anti-tech, whatever that would mean, but I do think we have to be very careful about the idea that we can sort of, you know, just turn these technologies under a different system toward um, toward ends that would be beneficial. And I, you know, I can name a number of projects that I think are, are doing really elegant and um, um, work with, uh, with, with technologies, but I think we have to think about, you know, we, we have to think about, you know, what, how exactly they're designed, who gets to design them, um, and whether they weren't, you know, actually kind of built with these types of ends in mind and need to be sort of deconstructed um, such that they could uh, serve other purposes. Uh, just to add to that quickly, I think the, the thing that comes to mind today is uh, there, there was um, a leak from Amazon recently about how at Whole Foods, you know, they're, they're creating this like map to see what stores are likely to unionize. And that's just such a perfect distillation of like what technology can do if it's used for the wrong purposes. And it's like, of course, um, to the person building this technology, they're probably thinking, oh, this is just a fun technology. It's, pro it's gotta be fine. My boss is paying me to do it. Like there can't be any problems. This is like all legal. And yet, you know, of course, if you're a worker at, uh, at one of these stores and you hear about this technology, you just feel betrayed because this technology is obviously not for you. It's to control you. It's to make your life worse. Yeah, it's to violate your, you know, protected labor rights, right? Like one of the data inputs that I was reading on that was, you know, calls to the HR tip line, right? Like if, um, if you want to, you know, you want to talk about Shady, I think that's, you know, there it is. But again, who had a choice of whether to make that technology, right? Amazon could make that. There's not, there's not a scrappy enough union that could make that in the time needed to sort of identify hotspots where unionization and organizing might be necessary. I mean, I think you could try, but I would say put your resources elsewhere if you're a union. Another, I, I want to pull a question from the, uh, from the sidebar uh, from JS, uh, which, which was um, uh, basically asking about how we can uh, cross from uh, cross class to international solidarity. Um, you know, a lot of this work is, um, you know, is outsourced to developing countries. Uh, of course, you know, different laws apply, wages are lower. Um, in my, my own research, I'll just add that, uh, you know, I thought I was studying the fissured workplace and the gig economy and come to find out most of this stuff was pioneered uh, trying to get around Mexican and Indian labor laws um, in the 70s. So, um, yeah, could you speak at all to, uh, you know, looking beyond the, the you know, domestic, um, domestic scene and, and if there are ways to, um, across vast distances, uh, engage in those kinds of solidarities? I mean, I will... I will back that a thousand percent. It absolutely needs to be international, right? And we need to think, you know, who are the content moderators? Who are the people who are labeling the data and, you know, who, you know, in these outsourced sort of um, like Turk worker shops, um, who are the cobalt miners, right? I think we can begin to have a map on like, you know, 
where are their sort of, what are the essential workers on whom tech is dependent um, and think about, you know, solidarity building internationally. I think this is, you know, this is not a new problem and I would, you know, I am, I am not an expert on building this sort of, you know, radical international, right? I think there have been people thinking about this and working on this for, you know, many, many decades, you know, centuries, depending on how we count. Um, but it has never been more urgent than now if we look at the, you know, the, the, the vast distribution of, or, or, the, or the, the, the vast influence of the power of a small number of firms um, across, you know, multinational terrains. And I think, you know, it, I think it's going to call into being new forms of organizing, call into being new forms of solidarity. Um, and I, you know, I want to support the people who are working on that and I want to think with them about it. But I, you know, again, I think it's, you know, I got to be humble. I, I don't know the answer to that. I just know it's necessary. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. Um, and I think just to talk a little bit about the context, I mean, there is a reason that Silicon Valley is associated with the U.S. There's a reason so much money flows towards U.S. firms. And even though Silicon Valley did not necessarily create the problem, they're still benefiting from it. They're still benefiting from this highly unequal uh, world system where countries like the United States with its huge military budget um, and all the other companies in its kind of uh, under its aegis, uh, they're benefiting from these unequal trade agreements. They're benefiting from the fact that workers in many other countries are not afforded the same labor protections or, you know, a living wage. And, and so I think if we start to investigate where all these companies make their money, then we, we should be talking a lot about um, uh, workers who expand, you know, who are not within the borders of the United States because you know, where does Apple make its money? It's not just software engineers in, um, in the Bay Area. It's also factory workers who are working under just horrible, grueling conditions, and they're paid so little. And, but at the same time, I mean, companies like Apple and really any company that outsources manufacturing, they don't, they don't necessarily call those workers, you know, as actual workers. Sometimes they just have agreements with other companies um, down the global value chain. And then they get to say, it's like, oh, we only have, you know, 100,000 workers and we're making this much profit. Look at how innovative we are. It's like, well, I'm sure there's some innovation going on, but a lot of that innovation is just applied at arbitraging labor standards. Uh, and, you know, this isn't new. It's not like Apple made pioneered this. We've, we've been seeing this um, for decades. And if you look at a company like, like Nike, Nike is kind of the poster child for this, where Nike owns their brand and they own the intellectual property around the shoes and products they produce. They don't actually make their products. They don't have to. They can just outsource it to factories and then just uh, claim plausible deniability when a factory is on fire and workers are dying or workers are paid below minimum wage. So I think what these companies are doing, um, the way they make their money is just, it's structured by the conditions of the rest of the world. And, and so I think it's, it's, a, it's a difficult conversation to have because, you know, you can't blame these companies for creating these conditions. It's not Uber's fault necessarily that, you know, it was able to get away with um, violating labor law to such an e egregious extent. But I mean, at the same time, we should say that these workers, uh, these companies had the chance to do something better. And they chose not to because they chose to follow the money. They chose to take the most profitable routes, which does mean for the most part, paying um, workers as little as they can get away with paying them. And we're seeing this with, you know, Uber, Amazon, but also companies like Google and Facebook and the way they have um, this huge army of contract workers. Uh, but I think, I mean, just going beyond that, and this is a bit of a, like a weird theoretical point to make, but companies like Google and Facebook, when they're making money from advertising, their workers don't just include the people who are actually working on the product. Um, indirectly, the, peop the workers who create the products that make the money are those who make the things that get advertised on Facebook. And so, you know, if Facebook is taking money from Nike, where does that money come from? That is an advertising budget. That is money that could have been paid to their workers, but instead is being paid to an advertising middleman. And so, yeah, and I think this is like, it's, it's so important to think to think critically about where these companies are making their money and ask who is more deserving of that money, who has been doing the work that they should have been paid for, but has been unable 
to have access to that money for reasons outside of their control, you know, because of trade agreements, because of um, labor laws in their country, because they're, you know, they were born in a world where the U.S. is the reigning superpower and they just happen to have been born in a different country. And yeah, I think it's really important to remember how much of this is contingent. And so, you know, going back to the question of international solidarity, I think that's so important, right? Like none of us choose where we're born. We don't choose um, the relations between the countries that are in our world. And, and it's, I think it's silly to act as if, you know, our affinity to our nation state should trump our affinity to each other as human beings. And this just, it all seems really difficult, but you know, for those of us who, who do care about building a more just world, I think international solidarity has to be at the forefront of the agenda. What are the concrete steps people can take to uh, like take direction directly from, from the ground, from social movements? Um, you know, uh, things like you know, No Tech for Rice or the way that other of these things have, have, have gone down. What's, what's, what are the concrete, beyond just you know, take leadership, what are the concrete steps that people can take? Um, you, want my, you want my rap, Brian? <laughs> 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 um, I mean, I don't, yeah, again, I don't have a generalized answer, but you know, start talking to your coworkers. Um, start asking them what they care about. Investigate, you know, on whose backs your wealth was built. Like, dig into that deeply uncomfortable question because we're all going to have an answer. You know, many of us will have an answer we don't like, right? And I think if this, if there is, you know, th there are like gleams of optimism through this, this deeply dark moment. And one of them is that we have just seen so clearly who is truly essential right? Who are the workers on whom these companies are dependent? It is the warehouse workers, right? It is the, you know, it is the, you know, the Instacart shoppers, these, you know, people who are protesting for like masks. And then when they got masks, they're like weird, like t-shirt material, right? Like these are, you know, we, we are seeing that these sort of, there is a, a conflation of sort of essential and expendable. Um, and that, that, you know, that, you know, and, and that there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of sort of organizing momentum there. I, I think, you know, start talking to your colleagues. We have a, you know, for the work from home crowd, there's a, there's a sort of advantageous environment because we can just set up a Zoom call and start, maybe not Zoom, maybe Jitsi, but like, um, you know, start having those conversations and start asking those questions and then sort of digging into kind of the, the movements at the ground, right? I think, you know, No Tech for ICE is a, is a broadly distributed sort of, you know, set of actions and movements and sort of organizing protocols. But one of the things that it recognized was this, you know, this often hidden connection between these, you know, big data systems, these, you know, the network analysis tools that are built by Palantir, the infrastructural hosting that is provided by Amazon, and the increase in extremely personalized and targeted ICE actions, right, that were leading to deportations, family separations, et cetera, right, and, and realizing like, hey, in our communities, suddenly, you know, it's not just a workplace raid that we can get a call, you know, hopefully get a call about and, and sort of get out of there beforehand. It's ICE following us to our schools, to our hospitals. It seems like the, the information they have on us and the ability to sort of track us and sort of target us has changed dramatically. We might not know why that's happening, but, you know, there are some people building, you know, there are some people who do. And if we can connect those dots, um, we can, you know, begin to organize and, and really put the pressure on the companies that are providing those infrastructures. And I would, I would give a shout out to the organization Mi Gente, who has been working, um, you know, directly with, with frontline communities on the southern border, but has also been pushing the No Tech for ICE campaign and has done tremendous work just digging up FOIAs and a lot of information that wasn't readily available on how much ICE relies on these technical infrastructures of surveillance tracking and control. So that's, you know, that's a, that's a little nugget, a little inspiration, but across the industry, there are just, you know, it is ripe for this type of kind of, you know, research and organizing and sort of, you know, creative solidarity building. Um, the, the other problem is that everything just seems so bad right now that it's almost like, where do I start? Right? Like the, the scale of the enormity of the problems we're seeing just feel like they can't be surmounted. But at the same time, you know, it's, it starts with like a step, like you don't, we're not gonna fix all these problems overnight, but you have to start somewhere and you just gotta start with like, what's around you, talk to your coworkers, 
get involved with like activist groups. Um, someone mentioned Tech Workers Coalition in, in the chat and I definitely would recommend that people check out Tech Workers Coalition. Find um, like community groups and just take a look at the world around you and see what other people are thinking about things the same way and link up with them and yeah, see what you can do. This may be the last question um, we have time for, uh, but there's a question here about um, sort of uh, so different subcultures in, in Silicon Valley, in particular, uh, the, you know, the sense of, of meritocracy, um, natural hierarchies uh, that sort of justifies uh, vast inequality. Um, and is that something that's, um, uh, is that within the Valley's overall political liberalism or is that more underground or how does that, how, how do you, do you find that? How do you engage with that? Um, yeah, I guess the broader issue is meritocracy. Well, um, I'll talk. I'll talk with this for a bit. So it's it's such a funny thing to talk about because um, really embarrassing. But I used to think meritocracy was something that Silicon Valley had invented, and I, I didn't realize that it's something that like you know has existed for a very long time, and has become this kind of legitimating myth to justify inequalities that exist. I didn't realize that. I remember um, GitHub, which is a, a company that was acquired by Microsoft recently. When, when they were still, you know, a young, hot startup, they, they had this rug, that had the, the word meritocracy on it, and um, they got a lot of backlash for that because at the time, I mean, the company, it was definitely not very diverse in terms of its employees, and not long after that, um, one of their few female engineers uh, accused, you know, the people of the company of discrimination, and so it was just this wonderful case of, like, irony. Uh, this company claiming that it's meritocratic, and yet the people who are within it don't necessarily agree. But I think the idea of meritocracy is a very powerful one, um, partly for almost obvious reasons, right? Where if, if you have, if you have a, like an industry or ecosystem that is glamorized and is accruing so many rewards where people can become tre tremendously wealthy just by you know, starting a startup or writing code or something, then of course the people in that field want to believe that it was earned. They want to believe that it was their merit. They don't want to think that it was a handout. They don't want to think that there were biases, you know, in favor of them. They want to think that the system was fair and they're at the top because they earned it. They deserve it. They worked hard. They're smart. You know, it's just, it's just natural. And I think this is something that um, is, it's like when you put it that way, it feels a little silly <laughs> because you're like, oh, of, of course they believe that, you know, who wouldn't? But I think that's an, you know, an accurate description of what's happening in the tech industry. And the, the, the big problem with that is the people for whom meritocracy is not working, the people who uh, are mostly you know, women, people of color, people from non-traditional backgrounds who are not able to succeed in the same way, uh, the ones who do succeed find it very easy to just write them off. And so meritocracy has this compounding effect where any criticism of it only shores it up. Right, because you, you let's say you have all these women who are saying, "Oh, the industry is really sexist; it's not working for me." And then the men are just, Ugh, "You're just a victim. You're just complaining because you can hack it." It's like you know which which interpretation is true. I mean, I think if we were to look at it from the outside, I think it's really important to remember that any definition of merit is always one that's contested. It's not a universal one. It's the definition is created by those who have the power to define it. And we should always be suspicious of those who are trying to justify their own power. And we have to remember that um, the, the idea of meritocracy can only be introduced in a system that is already riven with other forms of inequality. So, you know, you have sexism, racism, you have all these other kinds of um, modes of discrimination that already exist. And meritocracy does not does not ever exist um, in a vacuum apart from that. You said it, I think. And it's, it's notable that the first use of the term was in sort of satirizing it, right? Like this is a kind of, a, an, you know, kind of the perfect topology that people in power get to define this as a meritocracy and uh, we're all good. Um, I think, you know, again, it's sort of a symptom of this sort of, you know, broader think like means testing world we're living in, right? Where there are people who are presupposed not to have merit, not to deserve resources and well-being and you know within that only certain people can rise to the top i mean i think you know at this moment the absurdity of it couldn't be starker right like a meritocracy would be where warehouse workers are perhaps making you know closer to bezos salaries right but um you know the, the sort of 
the idea of tying sort of remuneration to waged work and distributing re resources through the value, the perceived value of people's waged work is sort of, you know, something I think we need to pick apart as we're picking apart kind of Silicon Valley's sort of shallow and self-serving conception of itself as a meritocracy. So sort of taking this to the close here, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, one of our aims for this event is to use what we know uh, to think together about, about a way forward. So uh, Meredith and Wendy, uh, can you help us close the call with, with some ideas for actions or, or things to think about? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll uh, give this a shot. So, I mean, it, it's hard because I think we're, we're living through a really bleak and difficult time. Um, and it's easy to just look at all the news and just feel incredibly demoralized and um, pessimistic about what's going to happen. But I think it, you know, at a time like this, we need, we need optimism more than ever. And we need, to, we need to be realistic, sure, but we also need to believe that there is a sliver of light on the horizon that we can aim towards. And I think for, for me, the, the way I get that kind of optimism, it's, it's by looking at, um, it's by looking at the, the good that's coming out of this in the sense that, you know, we're, we are shifting the way we understand society. We're shifting um, our, our relationships with each other. I think people are coming to realize that human contact is actually important and that there are workers who are doing essential work but not getting the amount of money they, they deserve. Um, and also that the people who are making the most money aren't actually doing anything right now. Like Jeff Bezos is not, de is not delivering your packages. Um, he, he's got like a ton of, you know, houses he can hold up in. So yeah, I think the, it, you know, if I'm going to try and be optimistic, it's by thinking of just the, the ways in which the perceived wisdom about how the economy must work have been challenged by this crisis. And I hope that after this, people will come out of it with a, a new perspective and think, well, you know, what do we actually need? How do we actually want society to work? Um, and then I hope they realize that, I hope they ground their new perspective in solidarity with each other, with the people who have, you know, brought them food or the people who they've uh, quarantined with, the people who, the healthcare workers who have taken care of them, the people who cl keep the streets clean. Um, and I hope, yeah, I hope there's this kind of renewed notion of solidarity and just this part of being in a society and that we need a society like society is some is so core to the way we to you know to, just, to the way we're socialized and like a world where we're all these atomized individuals who don't have any human relations with each other outside of the market um, that's that seems really sad and I, and I hope we, we build something new that's grounded in a deeper notion of solidarity yes that um, I yeah I think I think Solidarity is being formed through networks of care right now and thinking about how we can sort of reorient our work and, you know, the work we demand of the institutions around us toward that radical politics of care is a project we all have a role in engaging in. And we've, you know, we've been given like this sort of cursed gift of seeing it so clearly with such, you know, um, I, you know, in such a difficult way but it's very clear that that is this, you know those are the connective tissues on which sort of a healthy world and you know healthy lives are built and I think you know we can also see who is sort of being harmed the most by the lack of those infrastructures and these sort of you know kind of this this uh this sort of neoliberal racialized capitalism that is governing the you know this sort of um the death drive that we're currently um encountering so uh, I'll leave it there, but I, I, there's always hope. Nothing's inevitable, and there's a lot of really wonderful work going on. So I want to thank, thank all of you again for this space, and thank you so much, Wendy. Um, I'm so excited we got to have this conversation, and thank you, Brian. All right, so th thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight, um, and thank you so much to Wendy and Meredith uh, for, for coming by um, Wendy's book. Abolish Silicon Valley is available for purchase and the library. Uh, so thanks again, Wendy Meredith, and to all of you, a uh, good night. Thank you very much for stopping by.